Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids and cubs, and welcome to season four and episode number 514 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is 513. 513, sorry. Today, recording day is Thursday, November 14th, 2024, and it is an absolutely spectacular day here at the Beaver Lodge. It was just outside early this morning, and a gorgeous uh, sunrise today. You got pinks and magentas and blues in the sky. It's just beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver Ray, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com for their continued support. Got a good show for you today, but uh, before we do anything else, Mr. Grizzly, how is your mental health doing today, sir? Uh, it's, it's, it's better than it was yesterday. I'm still not, still not 100%. I'm far from it. My, I'm still having this gastro thing. I woke up at midnight with... <laughs> horrible heartburn Ooh. and the only thing yeah like brutal to the point where i was like nauseous and i'm like oh, okay i don't know what to do and i'm like oh wait a minute I, I pull up this website that's got home remedies that work well and i knew i remember something about apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. bridget had just brought some over so i mixed some apple cider vinegar with water you're supposed to put honey in it too but i don't have any honey in the house so i drank the apple cider vinegar and water which really doesn't taste good yep <laughs> but it worked it worked uh it killed the heartburn pretty quickly within i'd say about 10 minutes which was surprising nice and the nausea went away shortly thereafter but the gaseousness is still very much present so i'm very belchy and uh, yes flatulent <laughs> <laughs> Good sir, how are you today? Belchy and flatulent, how about you? <laughs> exactly. Not, not, oh, not right. an ideal picture, I can tell you. And I'm, you know, I've, I've, there's guys I've played hockey with that were uh, strict vegetarians, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm burpy and farty. I'm like, well, I'm belchy and flatulent. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Okay. Um... Things are pretty good at this end, too. Um, for those who are wanting a Beaver Lodge curling report, me and Kit Michael played our doubles match yesterday, and uh, it was a weird one. Uh, we opened with three, but for some reason couldn't defend, so we allowed the other team to score three, and then we scored another three and still couldn't defend, so we allowed the team to score four. And then we tied it up with one end left, and then in the last end, neither of us could make a damn shot. So... We were playing against a team that won the team championship twice and just played at a huge uh, Ontario level cash spiel. 
So, I mean, that we were able to hang with them for five straight ends, but the wheels just completely fell apart. And despite the fact that we we're playing very well, we still might go down to division because everybody in the whole damn pool is playing well. Not anybody had a bad round. So even though we, we haven't lost, we, we've lost, we've, we have three matches in which we've actually not lost and three matches in which we have lost and we have one match left, and normally that's enough to stay in, but not this time. So uh, we absolutely have to win next week if uh, we want to stay in A or hope for one or two teams to uh, do us a favor um, by losing. So uh, it's kind of disappointing because <laughs> we thought we were in since we started off so well. But hey, still one week left, and uh, our destiny is in our own hands, a tie or a win, and uh, we stay. So. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a team uh, that we played yesterday that uh, I've never beaten in four years. And this was the closest. And I was just so disappointed because it was like right there. <laughs> and we didn't get it. Oh, well, c'est la vie. Um, in the news, Kits and Cubs, uh, there's enough going on. Nothing major. Uh, there's, uh, we're not going to talk about it you know, because I'm sure you've all heard about uh, the various uh, appointments in the United States that made everybody go, what the hell? What so, the hell? Uh, but we talked enough about that guy yesterday, so uh, we'll take a couple of days off. Um, today, however, in the news, uh, one of the first things that we need to mention that we did forget to mention yesterday is uh, the passing of a uh, former premier of uh, British Columbia, John Horgan. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, we really apologize for not uh, having been able to get to that yesterday. Uh, it would seem that his family had uh, made the announcement originally yesterday. Uh, there was a tweet. Um, I'm not sure if it came. It was sent from uh, by uh, Sheena McConnell, who I would, yeah, see, former press secretary, that's what I assumed, and senior advisor. Uh, to uh, John Horgan, and uh, the message says, from the family, our hearts are broken to announce the passing of our beloved husband, father, and friend, John Horgan. John passed away peacefully this morning at Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria. The well-being of British Columbia and everyone in it was everything to him. He was surrounded by family, friends, and love in his final days. Ellie and the rest of John's family asked for privacy during this time of mourning, and uh, his favorite quote, live long and prosper. Mm. Uh, added to it now according to whoops okay well that's really weird what's happening right now um so, so my uh, screen for some reason is uh not shifting as i had requested which is very weird um okay i'm supposed to have a cbc news article here and for some reason it did not appear but let's try that again. There we go. Uh, this is from uh, Courtney Dixon from CBC. Former BC Premier John Horgan has died at the age of 65, CBC News has confirmed. In June this year, Horgan told CBC that he had been diagnosed with cancer for a third time during a routine follow-up appointment for his previous throat cancer. Horgan went on leave from his position as Canada's ambassador to Germany at the time. He is survived by his wife, Ellie, and their two sons, Evan and Nate. In a statement posted to X by Horgan's longtime friend and press secretary, Sheena McConnell, the Hogan family said he passed away peacefully at the Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria on Tuesday morning. Um, longtime BC New Democrat Mike Farnworth was supposed to see Horgan Tuesday morning, but instead learned his friend of 36 years had passed away. Quote, he was a remarkable person, a really remarkable person, Farnworth said through tears. Farnworth lit up as he shared stories of Horgan with reporters. Quote, it didn't matter who you were, what you did, he was able to connect with you, sit down, have a conversation, have a beer, whatever. Whether you agreed with his politics or you didn't agree with his politics, he just had this ability to connect with people. Born in Victoria, Horgan was raised by a single mother following the passing of his father when Horgan was just an infant. He attended Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, where he earned an undergraduate degree in history and Canadian studies and met his future wife, Ellie. He then went to Australia, where he completed a master's degree in history at the University of Sydney. He then looked for work in a museum in Ottawa, he told CBC News in 2011. 
The only job he could get was on Parliament Hill opening the mail, which he pushed them towards a pol uh, which pushed him towards politics as a career. Horgan was first elected to the BC legislature in 2005 and became leader of the NDP in 2014. He became BC's premier in 2017, holding the province's top job until 2022 when he announced he would be stepping down. He cited his health and lack of energy as the primary reason. Horgan left his seat as a member of the Legislative Assembly the following spring. During this time in office, Horgan eliminated the Medical Services Plan premium and pushed BC to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. He saw the province through COVID-19 pandemic, several devastating wildfires and floods, and a worsening toxic drug crisis. Hyaltsik Nation elected Chief Council, Councillor Marilyn Slett said Horgan spent time in her community after a tugboat spilled 110,000 liters of diesel and oil in the traditional fishing territory of the Hyaltsik First Nation in 2016. It was one of many visits to the community, she said. Quote, for us, he was a genuine person, really cared deeply about working with Indigenous communities, Slett said. Former Premier Glenn Clark told CBC's BC Today host Michelle Elliott that Horgan was warm, authentic, and genuine. Quote, he wasn't a phony politician, Clark said. He was, of course, very quick, very smart, and told a lot of dad jokes. Former Premier Christy Clark, once Horgan's adversary in the legislature, said that while she disagreed with him on many things, he was a, quote, dedicated public servant. He loved people, she said during an interview on CBC's On the Coast. Quote, he delighted in seeing the fun that could be had behind the scenes, sometimes that the public didn't always see. Clark praised Horgan for his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Quote, in British Columbia, we saw less division around COVID than anywhere else in the country, she said. He and Health Minister Adrian Dix did a very good job in getting us through COVID with as few deaths as possible and with as much accordance among us as possible. I think he will be remembered for that. Mm. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau appointed Horgan as Canada's ambassador to Germany in November 2023. Trudeau expressed his condolences in a statement posted to social media. Quote, John Horgan believed in the power of public service. He saw it as a privilege, as a way to help others, and to make our country better. He loved British Columbia. As premier, he had a tenacity, passion, and dedication for his work that very few can match. He always believed that we would get more done if we worked together. The former premier was diagnosed with bladder cancer in 2008. He was declared cancer-free after surgery and treatment. Horgan was again diagnosed with cancer in late 2021 when a mass on his throat was found to be cancerous. Earlier this year, he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Quote, it is the third instance of cancer I have had, but I remain confident and hopeful that I will again live long and prosper, he said in a June statement. Premier David Eby said Tuesday that the flag at the Parliament buildings in Victoria will be lowered to half-mast in Horgan's honour. He described Horgan as a, quote, consequential premier at a critical time in our history. John was a remarkable man, Eby told reporters at the legislature. I think for many British Columbians, he made them think differently about politics and about politicians. He was accessible and he was fun and funny, and he was called Premier Dad, and rightly so. Eby said Horgan was a coach, a mentor, an inspiration who offered advice whenever it was needed. BC Housing Minister Ravi Kalan said that when he was first elected to the House, to the office, sorry, his house struggled because Callan was always away. He turned to Horgan for guidance. Quote, two weeks later, he showed up at my house unexpected with an RCMP detail, he said. He started playing Pokemon and playing Lego with my kid. When he left, my next, next day, my son said to me, I understand now why you're in Victoria, because you have to help people. Uncle John came to tell me that. Oh my God, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Amy said Horgan had a temper from time to time, adding that if you hadn't been yelled at by Horgan, you hadn't truly worked with him. I truly worked with John Horgan, he said with a smile. Horgan had an ability to turn a clear political liability moment into an asset, asset, E.B. said. He accidentally knocked over a water glass during a news conference about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which he opposed, and quickly remarked, spills can happen anywhere. During a heated conversation on privacy concerns and cell phones, E.B. recalled Horgan pulled out his own phone, unlocked it, and passed it around to reporters to see what apps were on it. Quote, there was a word game he particularly liked, E.B. said. He had the ability to take those moments where it was a tough moment or was just maybe a little embarrassing and made people just love him more. And for me, that really encapsulates who he was. So, uh, uh, Mr. Horgan, please uh, rest in peace. And uh, to all his family, uh, his friends, those who loved him and those he served for whom um, he had a lot of respect and for whom the people he served had respect for him. Uh, you have our deepest and most sincere condolences and sympathies.
Yeah, I didn't uh, honestly know a lot about the, uh, about the man. I mean, you know, it was, Canada's a bloody big country, so <laughs> if you're not over there, it's, you're not necessarily in touch. And the other thing was, it, he wasn't in the news a lot, and that's usually a good thing. Yes. Politics, right? So I, I would have every reason to believe he's all the good things that the accolades that have been rained down upon him since his passing were authentic. Yep, yep. Um, I have a little something because you mentioned it yesterday yeah. and uh, I didn't have much additional details, but uh, today I do because you talked about what was going on with AIMCO. Daniel Smith, and how it is that, uh, thankfully, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who has, how I could say, over the past couple of years, still tried to remain Prime Minister. Yes. From abroad, it would appear. Uh, well, it would appear that he he lives quite well still on the public dime here in Canada. He's got this uh, beautiful contract with the government of Saskatchewan that's existed for, I think, probably close to four years now. Something to that effect, yeah. Where he gets something like $250,000 a year or something for some mm -hmm. type of consulting work. Even though he's the chairman of the IDU, and has been particularly busy the last little while. So not sure what it is he is doing all of this uh, consulting, allegedly. But it seems that between uh, duties of, um, oh, how would you say, uh, trying to destroy the world, uh, be the human embodiment of uh, Voldemort in politics, uh, getting money from the Saskatchewan government from consulting and uh, running, in some way, a company called Harper and Associates, I believe it was. Uh, he has time as well, it seems, to be uh, the head of AIMCO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure how he does it or where it is that he finds the time. Now, according to uh, BNN Bloomberg here, it says, and this is from uh, Paula Sambo and uh, Leon Ode and Don Lim from uh, BNN Bloomberg here in Canada. And hopefully I'll be able to get this story to you here. And it says, Alberta's government has considered hiring former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper to oversee its public pension fund manager, which is without a permanent board after all of its directors were fired last week, according to people familiar with the matter. Harper's name has been circulating as a potential chair for the Alberta Investment Management Corporation for a number of months. The people said asking not to be named discussing private matters. The role would give Harper influence to reshape an organization managing some $169 billion Canadian of public pension and other government money, and with offices from Edmonton to London and New York, the former conservative politician governed Canada from 2006 to 2015 and lives in the Western province. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith's government is seeking major changes at AIMCO and sacked Chief Executive Officer Evan Siddle and the board last week, saying the firm's headcount and costs have swelled even as it managed a smaller portion of funds with its own staff. AIMCO has more than 200 investment professionals and more than 600 employees in total, according to publicly available information. Finance Minister Nate Horner is temporarily acting as AIMCO's chairman and sole director and long-serving bureaucrat Ray Gilmore is interim CEO of the firm, which invests for dozens of pensions and government accounts, including the province's sovereign wealth fund. Quote, Alberta's government will be announcing the new chair of AIMCO within the next couple of weeks, Ashley Stevenson, a government spokesperson, said in an emailed statement without commenting further. Harper now runs Harper & Associates, which provides advices, advice to businesses in the financial services, technology, and energy sectors. The firm touts access to Harper's global network and his experience as a former Group of Seven leader, according to his website. His office did not immediately reply to requests for comment. And let's not forget also, Gets and Cubs, that Harper is also on the board of Alimentation Custal, who is benefiting greatly from having all that beer in corner stores and grocery stores and big box stores that Doug Ford yeah. made happen because he doesn't have any plans for you to help you get a doctor. No, or an education. <laughs> that thinking.
<laughs> Inco has been through several significant changes in recent years. The firm began a leadership overhaul after a bad bet against market volatility cost at Canadian $2.1 billion when the pandemic roiled markets in 2020. The changes included appointing former BlackRock Incorporated executive Mark Wiseman as chair later that year. Wiseman then led the recruitment of new leadership, including Siddle as CEO. Wiseman stepped down at IMCO at the end of 2023. Chief Investment Officer Marlene Puffer left in September after less than two years in the job. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes you wonder why so many people take the job and leave quickly. Under Siddle's watch, AIMCO's investment team beat its benchmark in the three-year period ended December 31st with its balanced fund returning 6.2% annualized according to its annual report. The firm outperformed its benchmark in 2021 and 2022, but underperformed last year. AIMCO's balanced fund earned a 5.6 net return in the first six months of this year. Harper was first elected to Canada's House of Commons in 1993, then later left politics to run a conservative organization before returning to seek the leadership of the Canadian Alliance Party. That group later merged with another right-leaning party, and Harper ultimately led the Conservative Party of Canada to three straight election victories. Siddle said on LinkedIn that he is tying up loose ends, smelling wildflowers, reading, writing, playing guitar, badly, restoring my health and focusing on Sonia, our family, and our friends. Siddle is married to Sonia Verma, a prominent Canadian journalist. And then uh, with regard to the firing itself, uh, BNN reports here, that um, that the entire board of directors had uh, been fired. Uh, and in a statement, Finance Minister Nate Horner said that the changes at AIMCO are due to rising management fees coupled with a consistent failure to meet mandated benchmark returns. The decision takes effect immediately, and Horner will be the sole director and chair for AIMCO until a new chair is appointed within 30 days, with a new board established after that. He told reporters that he's been watching IMCO closely and determined changes weren't going to happen without a, quote, major reset. The pension fund's manager, chief executive officer, Evan Siddell, was also fired Thursday, as were three other senior executives. Siddell had been in the role since the summer of 2021. Quote, sometimes you just need a clean state, slate, Horner said, adding that an interim chief executive will be named in the coming days. I'm doing this because I'm the minister responsible, and costs like this are borne by all its clients, Albertans in general, and the pensions that they represent now. The province said that from 2019 to 2023, AIMCO's third-party management fees have increased by 96%, the number of employees increased by 29%, and wage and benefit costs increased by 71%. These costs all increased, it said, while AIMCO managed a smaller percentage of funds internally. AIMCO, in its latest annual report, said it had $161 billion of assets under management as of the end of last year, with 600 employees spread across offices in Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Luxembourg, and London, UK. It said it handles about $118 billion in investments for public sector pension plans, representing thousands of Albertans, including teachers, police officers, and municipal workers. Alberta Teachers Association President Jason Schilling said they are monitoring developments and will defend the interests of active and retired teachers as needed. Quote, the association disapproved of the government-mandated transferring of teacher pension assets to AIMCO in 2020, and we remain concerned about the politicization of pension policy. Oh, that's great. So the pensioners didn't want their pension transferred and the government turned around and said, well, screw you, we're doing it anyway. Because it's the government's pension and not the pensioner's pension. Freedom. Bad. If you live in Alberta, you know, you know, and it's not getting better anytime soon. No, it is not. They're just going to rob you blind. They don't care. They don't care as long as they get their their money. They don't care. It, it's 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 a bad bad situation. And Aimco just continues to lose money hand over fist. So why would anybody in the province actually think it would be a good idea to hand them a pension plan? I mean, they've been losing money for the last couple of years. Somebody pointed out, yeah, well, they had a good year where they returned. I go, yeah, okay, sure. They had a good year where the returns were really high. But compared that to the overall returns for the Canada Pension Plan, it's one of the most, the best performing funds on earth. Right. It, its returns are consistent every year. They dip a little bit, but they don't drop out of the bottom because they're blue chip stock investments. They're not into risky stuff, right? So right. It's, yeah. I know, I know. AIMCO is also responsible for managing the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund in which Premier Daniel Smith has pledged to stash over $250 billion. Court Ellingst Ellingson, the opposition NDP finance critic, called the move to get rid of the board of chief executive, quote, unprecedented. 
Quote, if they've been monitoring this for a while, they had many opportunities to do something that was not so drastic and earth-shattering as today's move, Ellingson said, adding he's concerned about what message is being sent with a political politician being the sole director of the corporation, even temporarily. Quote, in a fund of this size, you have investment decisions that are happening all the time, Ellingson said. The people who are on the other side negotiating those deals have just seen an elected partisan political person being put in charge of these funds. That makes them question the deal that they are making. It makes Albertans question the stability of this fund. It makes Albertans question whether or not that fund really is under the thumb of the Premier and the Finance Minister. AIMCO, which was established in 2008, has weathered controversy in recent years. In the spring of 2020, it took a $4 billion loss on the $110 billion it managed. AIMCO officials at this time said the loss was a result of COVID-19-related market swings, which also led to an ensuing oil price war. Then Premier Jason Kenney defended the fund manager, saying at the time that the loss was a fraction of what was seen elsewhere. This is also the third board to be fired in its entirety by the UCP government following Smith's firing of the Alberta Health Services Board in 2022 and the firing of the Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity Board last year. Okay, and this thing by Jason Kinney was uh, really interesting, that quote, because he's saying, at the time, the loss was a fraction of what was seen elsewhere. Oh, now conservatives want to com compare how com Canada is doing to its near-peer countries. Yes. Rather than comparing Canada pre-COVID to post-COVID, which will always be worse. Just like when they say GDP per capita. Yeah. Because every time you, got it, you add 1.2 million people in about three years, you add that to the denominator, mm -hmm. and the numerator stays the same or even goes up a little, the number you get is going to be smaller it's math conservatives want you to be mad because math yeah they, and they're, they're, they're not very good at math in case you haven't noticed <laughs> so it's it's not your share of the gdp does go to go to go down you don't start making 13 percent less because there's 1.2 million people it's just the overall number gets divided by 1.2 million more people Mm -hmm. which will drag the number down. So they're running all over TV going, oh my God, GP, GDP per capita is crushing and oh my God, we're so screwed. Oh my God. Well, there's an actual graph that if you actually check out, this is, I'll try to send it to you, Mr. Grizzly, when uh, you're, because you're, you're, I'm going to throw to you after this um, so that you can put it up. But like people want you to look at Canada and the US and you look at that graph and you see like Canada was ahead of the U.S. for a little bit at one point like this. And then the U.S. just really took off and Canada didn't. But if you look at the Canada line on that graph, specifically, this is the story the conservatives that are putting out don't want you to see. You look at that line and says, oh, well, see, just before Harper took over around Harper time, we were doing better than the United States. And then um, we started to do terrible compared to the United States. That's when the deviation started. Then Trudeau came in and the gap was closing. Then COVID happened, so the gap widened. And then the gap was closing again. And in the last little bit, it's dipped just a tiny bit. But does that tiny bit has conservatives losing their minds. The number right now is better than it ever was at any time during which Harper or Pierre was mm -hmm. in government before. But that doesn't stop them saying, oh my God, look how terrible we're doing compared to the United States. Okay, yes. But compared to ourselves, we're doing great. We're doing way better than we were doing when you guys were in charge. And that's after COVID and supply oh. chain issues and a war in Israel and Gaza and a war in Ukraine with the breadbasket of the world going tits mm -hmm. up. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing about Harper, when he first got elected, a lot of people said, oh, he's an economist. He's going to fix everything. And I'm like, uh, he's not a very good economist. Where did he graduate in his class at the bottom? Because he's really bad at this, as evidenced by the fact that the only people who benefited, which is the usual status quo for a conservative government, are the wealthy. The rest of us, we get screwed. Now, to pivot away from Alberta and go all the way to New Brunswick, with yeah. our good friend, Premier of New Brunswick, Susan Holt, she sat down with the Prime Minister yesterday, and guess what? I have a video clip. It's about two minutes, and I'm going to air it right now because she's doing for New Brunswick what Wab Canoe is doing for Manitoba.
making you things go, better. Uh, we certainly talked about school food at the meeting today because it was a clear priority during our campaign and it's a clear need across our province because there are too many students in New Brunswick that are going to school hungry and are struggling to learn because they don't have food in their bellies and too many teachers that are trying to fill the gap amidst everything else that they have on their plate. So uh, I was pleased to have the opportunity to explain to Prime Minister Trudeau some of the unique realities of New Brunswick and the fact that our current school food program doesn't reach certain schools in the north doesn't get distributed equitably across the province um, and to seek support from the federal government program uh, to fund the need here in New Brunswick in partnership with a provincial government that's ready to make sure that every kid has a chance to learn uh, with a universal school food program that every kid in this province can access. Et pendant votre campagne, euh, vous avez annoncé, promis un système de nourriture scolaire et vous aviez dit que vous étiez ouverte à signer un accord avec le fédéral. Est-ce que vous avez parlé de ça aujourd'hui oui. <rire> oui, on a parlé de ça aujourd'hui parce que c'est clairement une grosse priorité pour nous autres puis c'est une priorité partagée avec le gouvernement fédéral. Alors j'ai eu l'opportunité d'expliquer que nos besoins ici à Nouveau-Brunswick sont uniques. On a besoin d'assurer que chaque élève dans chaque école peut avoir un, un petit déjeuner universel. Puis euh, nous, nous sommes prêts à signer un accord pour le financement du gouvernement fédéral qui répond à notre réalité ici à Nouveau-Brunswick et le fait qu'on a plusieurs communautés dans tous les coins de la province qui ont des besoins différents. Euh, alors euh, j'ai hâte de, de signer un accord avec le gouvernement fédéral pour assurer que chaque élève à Nouveau-Brunswick peut commencer leur journée en école avec des ventes pleines et préparés à apprendre puis euh, de, de se préparer pour leur vie. Alors euh, euh, on va vraiment utiliser le programme fédéral pour le mieux être de Nouveau-Brunswick à Nouveau-Brunswick. Oui. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. he's turning things around quickly, right? Yeah, in uh, French, uh, she was basically saying that, uh, talking about the school food program and how the prime minister and her agreed that it's a priority to do that. And uh, she's very happy about that. Um, when we're uh, talking about that as well, uh, I think I saw it was in the Telegraph. Uh, I might be wrong here but uh, that the federal government has also announced that it is returning about $400 million to the province of New Brunswick from uh, health funds that it had uh, decided not to send to New Brunswick because there wasn't uh, as good uh, access to uh, abortion services mm. as needed to be in the province. And um, Susan Holt, has been rather busy on that as well, uh, according to Unifor here. Unifor is celebrating Premier Holt's reversal of policies that limited surgical abortion to hospital settings in New Brunswick within days of forming government, uh, the union says here. Quote, expanding access to women's reproductive care to healthcare is what we and many others advocated for and what New Brunswick's voted for, said Atlantic Regional Director Jennifer Murray. This is a bright light in a week where we have been reminded that our human rights, our right to self-determination, and our access to life-saving health care should never be taken for granted. Unifor advocated for reproductive justice and urged former Premier Blaine Higgs for many years to change the province's policy that restricted surgical abortion access to two hospitals in Moncton and one in Bathurst. The restriction led to the closure of Clinic 554 in Fredericton that was the sole source of access to sexual and reproductive care in that part of the province. Quote, this decision honors every person who spoke up, who rallied, who petitioned government, who persisted. This victory is for everyone who fought and who continues to fight for reproductive justice, said Murray. France allies, we made a difference. And the strongest weapons we had in this fight were our votes. Uniform mobilizes during provincial and federal elections to talk to members about issues important to workers and to encourage them to vote. The changes we want to see simply won't happen if we sit on the sidelines, said Murray. Change takes time and takes effort, and it demands that we engage in politics. Organized action is truly the only thing that will protect and strengthen our rights. Unifor is Canada's largest union in the private sector, representing more than 320,000 workers in every major area of the economy. The union advocates for working people and their rights, fights for equality and social justice in Canada and abroad, and strives to create progressive change for a better future. And um, according to the CBC here, um, and this is from uh, journalist 
Jacques Poitras, who, uh, by the way, if uh, you are not following him uh, and then you live in the, the New Brunswick area, you really should. He's uh, mm -hmm. one of uh, Canada's uh, better journalists by far. Um, he says that uh, the government has eliminated the legal restriction on public funding for procedural abortions outside hospitals. The cabinet order swept away the decades-old rule, a single sentence in the provincial regulation 8420, first put in place to block a Frederick, Fredericton clinic from offering the service. Premier Holt was applauded by members of her cabinet and caucus and dozens of women who fought the restrictions for years as she brandished a copy of the order. Quote, our team is proud to take this one small step, she said. We believe that abortion is health care and that everyone deserves access to the care that they need when and where they need it. Holt acknowledged the crowd of activists invited to her office, quote, who have done the work over the last 40 years, pushing for this constantly, making sure it didn't get forgotten, and it was always on the radar. Among them was Judy Burwell, a former manager of the Morgenthaler Clinic in Fredericton, the facility that led a previous government to adopt the restriction. Quote, it's a good day for everybody, not just for us, but for all the young people who've been working for abortion services and working very hard, Burwell said. Holt said health officials will now work with the New Brunswick Medical Society and the province's two health authorities to work out how physicians to offer work out how physicians to offer the service more widely across the province. That include that could include having it in some of the community health clinics the Liberal leader promised in this fall's election. Holt and Dornan said procedural abortions will be reclassified as minor, not major surgeries, and the government will sort out what fee doctors will be paid for it and what other support they will need. Quote, that will be starting tomorrow. What we've done today is allow that to happen, said Health Minister John Dornan. He said several doctors have already expressed an interest. Holt said the government aims to have those issues sorted out by May 31st of next year. Dr. Lise Babay, the president of the New Brunswick Medical Society, said she expects the process will be straightforward. I think it's going to take a little bit of planning, she said. We have to make sure that it's done properly. Currently, Medicare only funds procedural abortions in hospitals, and only three hospitals, two in Moncton and one in Bathurst, offer it. Former Premier Blaine Higgs argued in 2020 that the province's two health authorities were offering enough access to the service and would have told him if more was needed. Mm-hmm. Like, because he was listening to people that was telling him what was needed. Yeah, sure. Mm. But Dornan, a former CEO of the Horizon Health Authority, acknowledged Thursday that, quote, we probably missed a people that should have had access because of the travel distances to Moncton and Bathurst. Quote, I'm not sure that was entirely accurate, the community has told us. We want this outside hospitals. The regulatory restriction that was eliminated Thursday was adopted by one of Holt's Liberals' predecessors as Premier Frank McKenna in his attempts to block Dr. Henry Morgenthaler from offering the service at a downtown clinic he opened in 1994. Quote, he's going to get the fight of his life, McKenna vowed about at the time. Former clinic manager Simon Leibovich said Thursday she didn't believe she'd ever see the regulation change to eliminate the restriction. Quote, when you fight and fight and fight, you just get worn out, said Leibovich, who oversaw the shutdown of the clinic in 2014. It's a great day, she said. My question is, where do we go from here? Let's get it going. The Morgenthaler Clinic later reopened as Clinic 554 in 2015 when Dr. Adrian Edgar took it over. But he closed the clinic in February, saying it was no longer sustainable financially without Medicare funding, the abortions he provided there. Jula Hughes, a former University of New Brunswick law professor who co-authored a federal report on abortion access in New Brunswick, said many other issues remain to be resolved, but Thursday's change was momentous. Quote, it's not everything that needs to happen, but everything that needs to happen needed this to happen first. Edgar said Thursday that the change to the regulation allows him to look at providing the service again, though he said it may not happen in the same building. Quote, I would definitely become a provider again. It really opens doors up, Edgar said. This is a sensible move. We are really just catching up with the rest of the country. Martha Painter, a reproductive health expert who teaches nursing at the University of New Brunswick, said she expects the service will, be, will more likely be offered at community health centers providing other forms of care rather than in dedicated clinics. She said that's because a growing share of abortions in the province, more than 70% currently, are now, now done via mefepristone, a prescribed medication, meaning a shrinking demand for procedural abortions. Quote, the numbers are so low it would be extremely difficult to support a dedicated clinic, she said. But Painter hailed, hailed the regulatory change as a watershed moment for the province nonetheless. Quote, we simply won't feel like such outsiders, she said. There has been this special and disparaging treatment towards New Brunswick abortion care providers from the province, so this is very important from a symbolic perspective. Harini Sevalingam of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is suing the province over the regulation, was at Holt's news conference and told reporters the organization will likely withdraw the lawsuit soon. Quote, we expect that this announcement will render our legal action moot, she said. So this is just great news. Uh, this was from when now? 
go check the date on that for you kids and cubs. I think it was seven days. Because it was last week, I think, November 7th. So one week ago exactly. I have the video clip if you'd like to look at it. Yes, please. Just a second. The last remaining restriction on publicly funded abortion has been struck out. Clinics can now receive Medicare funding for surgical abortion, a big step for New Brunswick. Today, our cabinet has repealed, let me get this right, paragraph A1 of Schedule 2 of the New Brunswick Regulation 8420 under the Medical Services Payment Act, and it has been confirmed by the Lieutenant Governor. Susan Holt made it one of her first actions in government, but with surgical abortion only being done in three hospitals, she says the service is not yet accessible to all New Brunswickers. We want to acknowledge that this does not change the fact that abortions will not become accessible tomorrow in New Brunswick. There is work to be done with the medical professionals and with the people in this room to make sure that we take this step and we move to get that access into community. Holt took this step because New Brunswick had regulation that was specifically put in place to block clinic abortion. 30 years ago, former Liberal Premier Frank McKenna changed regulation to block Dr. Henry Morgenthaler from offering the service at a Fredericton clinic. If Mr. T Morgenthaler tries to open a clinic in the province of New Brunswick, he's going to get the fight of his life from us. McKenna added a line to the Medical Services Payment Act to make it so abortions are only covered by Medicare if they're performed in a hospital and once the patient gets sign-off from two separate medical providers. In 2014, former Liberal Premier Brian Gallant removed the requirement for two doctors but left the line that excludes clinic abortions from Medicare funding. Finally, almost exactly 30 years later, Holt removed that line altogether. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association has an active lawsuit against the province alleging that that line is unconstitutional. The lawsuit has been active since 2021, but it's expected to be withdrawn. I do know that the litigation cost the taxpayer quite a bit um, because, you know, there was um, a lot of motions that the government uh, put forward, the previous government put forward to try to um, stall and, um, like, you know, they did a motion to strike. Um, the discovery process was dragged on, um, most, mostly because of the government um, dragging the discovery process. So it definitely cost the taxpayers um, quite a bit of um, fun. Um, but um, thankfully, we had a talented team of pro bono lawyers that did this uh, work for CCLA um, on a pro bono basis. The Premier and Health Minister both admit that removing a barrier is not the same as making the service more accessible. Holt says the clinics she promises to open in the coming years may be able to provide abortions. She says she's also open to expanding the service to more hospitals. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that, Mr. Grizzly. So, I mean, when we say that elections have consequences, right? Now, here, here's about the 400, sorry, not four, I said 400 million, it's 400,000. Sorry. <laughs> I think, I hope I Big said 400,000 the first time. Um, but Ottawa to return part of the 400,000 it clawed back from New Brunswick over abortion, according to Adam Hurra like of the Telegraph percent. Journal. The Trudeau government says it will now return some, but not all of the nearly $400,000 it clawed back in federal health transfers from New Brunswick for not funding out of hospital abortion services. The feds have confirmed to Brunswick News that they expect to now pay out the 109,275 it withheld in the current fiscal year. That's after Premier Susan Holt announced last week that her cabinet had repealed a ban on funding abortions outside hospitals. But the money held back over the last three years won't be returned in states. The feds began cutting health transfers to New Brunswick four years ago by the exact amount it calculated New Brunswickers had spent out of pocket on abortions at a Fredericton clinic that Ottawa said should be covered by Medicare. That's as a single sentence in provincial regulations blocked public funding for pro sorry for procedural abortions outside hospitals. The Trudeau government first warned five years ago that it would begin to withhold part of New Brunswick's cut of the Canada health transfer if it didn't change its funding rules. It then clawed back dollars in each of the last four years, beginning with 140216 in 2021, then 64850 in 2022, 64850 in 2023, and 109275 in the current fiscal year in attempts to pressure the province into making the change. All along, the Fed said that their deductions to healthcare transfers may be reimbursed if the province carried out what it calls a, quote, reimbursement action plan to eliminate the patient charges as well as the circumstances that led to them. The whole government seemingly did that with a cabinet order. 
The feds have now confirmed it. Quote, with New Brunswick's announcement, it appears that both the patient charges and circumstance that led them to them have been resolved, said Matthew Conberg, press secretary for the federal health minister, Mark Holland. Health Canada will be reaching out to New Brunswick officials to discuss the steps required for the province to receive a reimbursement. It is expected the province could be reimbursed before the end of the fiscal year. But Cronberg added that New Brunswick is, quote, no longer eligible for reimbursement of its 2023 or earlier deductions. He pointed to the Canada Health Act reimbursement policy that allows the jurisdiction to be reimbursed for that deduction if within two years of the deduction, the patient charges and the circumstances that led to them are eliminated. It then adds that accurate reporting of patient charges is also required for a province to remain eligible for ongoing reimbursements. The feds contend that the Higgs government didn't calculate that cost last year. To clarify, the 2023 deduction is not refundable due to the inaccurate New Brunswick reporting of patient charges, Kronberg said. Accurate reporting of patient charges is required for a province to remain eligible for ongoing reimbursements. New Brunswick reported a nil when Ottawa when asked to quantify those patient charges according to Ottawa. Because they reported nil and were and we were aware of patients being charged, we had to create an estimate and they disqualified themselves from reimbursement of the 2023 deduction, Kronberg said. It means that the remainder of the nearly $400,000 is now lost. The Higgs government was defiant in the face of Ottawa's moves, suggesting they were made in step with the election cycle as a political wedge issue. That's as Blaine's continued to tempt anyone who believed the province should be doing more to take them to court, which the Canadian Civil Liberty Liberties Association did in filing a lawsuit aimed at forcing the province to fund abortions at the clinic. Higgs also pointed to how the cost of abortions at the clinic was declining. After years of resisting the creation of further access to abortion services, New Brunswick, under the gallant liberals, became the first province in 2017 to provide universal coverage of the abortion pill. Uh, Mifejimiso can be prescribed to patients who are less than nine weeks pregnant. I'm guessing that's the brand name and not uh, the regular street mm -hmm. name of the drug right there. Access to the pill had been Higgs' central argument against expanding the number of locations where surgical abortion is available, suggesting it isn't needed. Surgical abortions were only available in three hospitals, the Chaleur Régional Hospital in Bathurst, and then the Moncton Hospital and the Dr. Georges L. Dumont, both in the hub city. So there you go. Money being returned, access being returned, all the good stuff. You got to vote for good sure. people. Yeah. Mr. Grizzly, do you have anything today? I do. I got a few different things. This uh, I want to take a look at this one here from the Ontario NDP. I've got a an announcement from Merritt Stiles, and y'all know how much I love her. And that's not sarcasm. I think she's amazing. Right. And have a look at this. She's talking about the Ontario Housing Fund. This is uh, monumental, to say the least, if she can pull it off. Hi, I'm Mara Stiles, leader of Ontario's NDP, and I'm here at the Willowside Housing Co-op. Uh, Co-ops like this, we used to build them up until the mid 90s. Lots of families live here, kids have been raised here. Ontario needs more options like this. We are in a housing crisis like we've never seen before. The government isn't doing enough to actually build the housing that we need. That's why we're introducing Homes Ontario. It's our plan to build truly affordable homes for Ontarians. Rent geared to income, co-op housing, not-for-profit housing, and we're gonna bring back real rent control and stop unlawful evictions so people can stay and live in their homes. Homes Ontario means that we'll be able to build more housing that's more affordable for more people. People will be able to afford to live in the communities where they want to live and raise a family, like Kitchener-Waterloo. Ontario, you deserve a government that works as hard as you do. Building homes, hiring doctors, fixing schools, and making life more affordable. Ontario's New Democrats, we're going to deliver. She's saying all the things I want to hear, and I hope that she gets a chance mm -hmm. to actually try to deliver on this. She's good. I mean, she's a good person. She's, you know, she's, she knows what she's doing. She's smart. I would love to see her have the opportunity to pull this off, because I think she could. I could see that. I believe she could. And I mean, she needs to get elected first and we have to get rid of Doug Ford because wow, <laughs> I don't even think I need to go down the, the uh, pathway of why we need to get rid of Doug Ford, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> why do we need to get rid of Doug Ford, Mr. Grizzly? Well, he's just a, a corrupt, uh, wannabe mob boss. Basically. It's my opinion. All right. He behaves like one. 
And I'm going to put a link here in the chat to Homes Ontario. It's uh, Homes Ontario will be the largest home building program in Ontario's history, and it's how an NDP government under the leadership of Merritt Stiles will fix the housing crisis. You can add your name to it, and it's, I mean, in this way, they're harvesting, they're har harvesting data, of course, but it's up to you if you want to add your name to it. But it is a data harvesting method, of course. When, whenever you sign up for anything or submit your name, address, telephone, and email to any political party, you are now on, in their database and you will get mailers from them. I discovered that the hard way years ago. <laughs> so they're definitely data mining. Um, that's not up for debate. They are. I don't care for it, but that's they all do it, every single one. So if she gets elected and becomes the premier of the province of Ontario in the next election, which we're not sure when that will be, let's see what happens. Hopefully she can pull off some of the promises she wants to deliver. I believe she can. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully she'll get a large enough government that, that it's not a, you know, she could have a slim majority, which I'm never, you know, I'm never fond of majorities. But in this case, when we've had the damage done to us by the province, in the province by the progressive conservative, allegedly party of Ontario, I think a majority government of the NDP under Merritt Stiles might be able to turn things around. And I, and I think Merritt is more in line with Joe Clark conservatives a la Wab Canoe. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she's more like Ed Broadbent. But either way, I want her to have the opportunity to, to show us what she can do because I, I'm not a fan of Bonnie Crombie. I think she's literally uh, Ford light, to be honest. Hmm. Okay. Since we're talking about Ontario and Ford, uh, there's been a really interesting when uh, passed by your uh, eyeballs or ears. Uh, but um, Doug Ford is breaking ranks with us. Uh, according oh. to Cube Trichino, Premier Doug Ford said that while he's open to allowing municipalities to evict residents from encampments, he won't voluntary mental health hospitalizations. He made the comments about a request from some Ontario municipalities for the province to use the NOC to allow them to deal with homeless encampments. While the Premier signaled willingness to support the cities in their efforts, he said that he, quote, won't be sending them to the mental hospitals against their will. A spokesperson for the Premier's office location, if that means the government will reject the mayor's call for increased involuntary treatment. Nations around using the notwithstanding clause to overrule a 2023 Ontario Superior Court government municipalities are not able to evict people living in homeless encampments if there are no available shelter beds or other housing options for them to go, formally asked him to do so. This court decision stemmed from a lawsuit filed by individuals living in encampments and their advocates who argued that eviction without accessible alternatives violated their rights under the municipalities are not required by law to provide housing. This is primarily the responsibility of provincial and federal governments. They are in a complex position where they can't evict encampments available, but they also lack authority and funding to create adequate housing. The mayors argue that they're struggling to keep public spaces safe and accessible and restrictions. This lack of local capacity is leading more municipalities, including Hamilton, to consider standing clause. On Wednesday, Hamilton City Council will debate a motion through the courts or with new legislation. And I, Hamilton is Andrea Horvath. And I do not understand how someone who is the leader of the NDP, this pop and yet, here we are. And it seems I have gotten dark again <laughs> today. For Waterloo Region, the municipality involved in the original 2023 Claire and Redmond who is reportedly considering another legal bid to overturn the court's decision. We are going to support any municipality that goes ahead. Huh. You're, 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 getting, you're very chopped. Court right is there, not sir. for you're, you're not involved hospitalization for people in encampments. Not sure if he still feels the same way about people that have addictions issue specifically, but I don't know if Doug Ford 
um, seeing of the thing to do with the fact uh, that he actually believes suddenly in civil liberties and rather with the fact that he just doesn't have the personal to run the institutions that would be required to house everybody if he adopted that policy. So all of a sudden he's Mr. Wrights. I don't know if you were talking earlier because you're on my screen. You have like slowed down to a crawl. That's you, you have a bandwidth issue on your end. Yeah. You're cutting in and out. Oh. You're, yeah, okay. you're cutting in and out really badly. Uh, both your audio and your video is freezing and it's getting all blocky and choppy. So uh, I don't know if you're having a, a Wi Fi issue or if it's a network issue with your phone. But uh, yeah, either way, you're. you're, you're uh, it's a bandwidth limitation is the issue right now. So for those of folks in the chat going, what's going on? That's what's going on. So he's got a bandwidth limitation on his phone at the moment. So hopefully it will write itself in the next few minutes, but we don't know. Time will tell. The things are always a little bit uh, dicey with Restream. It can be a complicated system some days. And today is one of those days. In happy news, Taylor Swift kicks off her Eras Tour run in Toronto this evening. Three nights this week and three nights next, next week. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday next week. And somebody said, why didn't she play on Sunday? I'm like, because her partner is playing football on Sunday and she usually flies to watch the game. So, yeah. Taylor Swift, Toronto Eras Tour, Spurs City to move homeless to taxpayer-funded hotels for their own safety. Now, that's from the Daily Mail, so take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, it sounds like something that would take place. It would not be the first time that Toronto has pulled a stunt like that. You know, we have to, we can't see those people. We'll just move them out to another part of the city when they did during the, which, what was that where the riots took place in downtown Toronto during the, what was it, G8 or G20, when we spent millions of dollars for an artificial lake? under the Harper government. I can't remember exactly the dealing behind that. It was a number of years ago. So I don't have, I don't have everything uh, in front of me to, to give you all the details, but you may recall that. In other news, in the city of Toronto, not so good news. You know how Doug Ford wants to remove the bike lanes? Well, that's going to cost the city $48 million to do it. Is that money well spent? Just leave the bike lanes where they are. It's like, what, what, what are you doing? Dougie, Dougie, what, what's up, bro? Right, I can see you, sir, but I don't know if, uh, can't hear you. Yeah, you've got no audio. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, we'll wait. Yeah, no problem. I can keep rolling along while you're trying to get things fixed up on your end. So yeah, it's, uh, Toronto's going to spend $48 million to remove bike lanes that, as it turns out, most of the city is saying, please don't do that. Uh, the bike lanes don't cause traffic congestion. And uh, according to a number of studies, it looks like they actually alleviate a lot of it because people will ride their bikes. I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know. I've not read the study. I've not even seen a copy of it. But if that's the case, hey, great, awesome. If it helps to alleviate traffic congestion. But uh, you're right about that, Swanky Frankie. Nothing Doug's does is is smart. <laughs> It's like, seriously, he doesn't do anything smart. Okay, you're back. All right. There we go. That's better. Um, not sure when it is I started to cut it out and go choppy. Um, but uh, just to mention, um, the, what I was talking about was Doug Ford stating that he does not support involuntary hospitalization right. for people that are in encampments, which struck me as rather surprising because I think he yeah. still does, yeah, support it for uh, things having to do with addictions, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So I'm sitting there and wondering, as uh, this thing from uh, Doug Ford, as uh, has he suddenly become Mr. Wrights, or does he suddenly not support involuntary mental mental health hospitalizations because he doesn't have the staff to fund the institutions that he would need to house everybody in the first place. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, he's Mr. Civil Liberties. 
Yeah, I think it comes down to just that. Wait, it's going to cost us how much? Wait, we don't have the facilities? And well, we, we could build some camps quickly. I don't think we should build camps. That goes down a bad pathway. History proves that that's not good. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's suddenly looking progressive because of the fact that he realized how much money it would cost him and the province. And he's already, what, how much, how many billions is he giving away to hand us 200 bucks each? About three. Three billion dollars, yeah. yeah. And it's all, he's also created the largest deficit in the province's history, but he's fiscally responsible, progressive conservative, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Yep. Fiscally responsible when it comes to putting us in massive amounts of debt and giving money to his wealthy friends. Yeah. So he's got about 15 municipalities asking him to invoke the notwithstanding clause. He says he will, quote, he won't be sending them to the mental hospitals against their will, but he's willing to support cities in their efforts, which doesn't go together at all. Uh, Conversations around using the notwithstanding clause to overrule a 2023 Ontario Superior Court decision that determined municipalities are not able to evict people living in homeless encampments if there are no available shelter beds or other housing options for them to go to started when those 15 mayors formally asked them to do so. And the court decision stemmed from a lawsuit filed by individuals living in encampments and their advocates who argued that evictions without accessible alternatives violated their rights under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Since municipalities are not required by law to provide housing, because it's primarily the responsibility of provinces and the federal government, they are in a complex position where they can't evict encampments if shelter alternatives are unavailable, but they also lack the authority and funding to create the adequate housing s solutions. So, you know, the mayors are pretty much caught between a rock and a hard place when it comes to trying to address the situation. Um, one of the mayors, uh, one of the city councils spearheading this is Hamilton, which again, I find boggling because the mayor of Hamilton, I remind you, is Andrea Horvath, who used to be the leader of the NDP. But she wants to, she wants the notwithstanding clause used to suspend rights. I was like, who are you? Like, was the entire time you were the leader of the N NDP a fraud? I do not recognize this woman. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then um, Doug Ford decided once again, <sighs> I don't know if he really thinks that he has a chance to be Prime Minister of Canada one day. Because every now and then he keeps on s intervening with certain statements about stuff that are just way out of his lane. Like he just seems to be way out over his skis. And uh, the latest one here, because uh, you know that uh, he considers himself a Republican and is mm -hmm. a big, big, big GOP, if not Trump fan. And lives in the great um, state of Etobicoke, remember? Hmm. From iPolitics, David Legree. Ford calls for Mexico to be excluded from the North American trade deal. Why? They're part of North Not, America. Nobody was waiting for your opinion on that, Doug. Do you know how much stuff we bring in from Mexico that isn't just food? Do you know how many electronics are manufactured in Mexico? Do you know how yeah. many... Uh, manufacture uh, electronics are assembled in Mexico. Do you know how many car parts we get from Mexico? Uh, yeah. Once again, Ontario off stupid stuff without doing any bloody research whatsoever. I know. Ontario Premier Doug Ford wants Canada's next free trade agreement with the U.S. to exclude Mexico and called on the federal government to renegotiate a new bilateral deal with the incoming Trump administration. In a social media report on Tuesday, Ford said Mexico had become a backdoor for Chinese goods, which have undercut the Canadian and American markets, putting Ontario jobs at risk. Quote, you look at Mexico, they're importing cheap products, undercutting hardworking men and women, not only here, but in the U.S., from China, Ford said at an unrelated press conference in Oramidont, Ontario. Quote, they're slapping a Made in Mexico sticker on and shipping it up and taking our hardworking men and women's jobs away from them. It's unacceptable. In 2018, the three North American countries negotiated the Canada-United States-Mexico agreement to replace the North American Free Trade Agreement, which had been in place since the early 1990s. 
However, the first joint review for NAFTA II is scheduled for 2026, and U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has vowed to renegotiate this agreement, despite the fact the deal was originally negotiated during this first term. And that's the thing with this, is that this is supposed to be only a review after the first few years, and then they're supposed to agree on these review things, and then the agreement will be in place for the next 16. But with Trump, since he never follows any rules, he never, it's never going to be just a review. He's going to want to renegotiate it all, which is going to be interesting because after it was negotiated, he said it was the best deal that was ever negotiated. And now he's going to try and make people believe that the same deal that was the best deal that was ever negotiated by him just a few years ago is now the worst deal ever, that some other people made it such that uh, they got... Uh, the United States got screwed, but it was his deal. <laughs> Ford said it's in Ontario's best interest for Canada to reach a new nation-to-nation -nation agreement with the U.S. Quote, we'd be the third largest trading partner in the world to the U.S. if we were a standalone country, said Ford. Not sure how any of that changes. We're the number one export destination to 17 states and number two to 11 other states. So do we have a stake in this? 1,000%. If Mexico wants a bilateral trade deal with Canada, God bless them, but I'm not going to be drawn down with these cheap imports taking men and women's jobs from hardworking Ontarians. Data from the United Nations suggests, I know, suggests Chinese exports to Mexico have skyrocketed in these recent years, doubling since 2020. Earlier this year, Liberal government introduced a new 25% tariff on steel and aluminum imports from China. Ottawa also strengthened tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles and is currently considering additional measures for semiconductors, solar panels, batteries, and criminal, min cr criminal minerals. Uh, there's a type there. Essential yeah. minerals. <laughs> it actually says criminal minerals in the entire yeah, article. Just, made a um, and by the way, uh, the fact that we slapped that 25% tariff on steel aluminum, according to uh, word on the tweet, is something that pleases Trump very much. Not that we care, but happens to have that benefit. The announcement brought Canada into alignment with the U.S., which imposed stronger tariffs on Chinese goods, including EFEs of critical minerals, not criminal minerals, critical, and magnets used in manufacturing under President Joe Biden's administration. As reported by other news outlets, Trump has proposed a new 60% baseline tariff on all goods imported from China, as well as a 10% levy on imports from all other countries, though Mexico has cautioned against its policies. Quote, if Mexico won't fight transshipment by at the very least matching Canadian and American tariffs on Chinese imports, they shouldn't have a seat at the table or enjoy access to the largest economy in the world, Ford wrote on X. Instead, we must prioritize the closest economic partnership on Earth by directly negotiating a bilateral U.S.-Canada free trade agreement that puts U.S. and Canadian workers first. I think that's a terrible and sucky idea, because when you're in a situation of two against one, it's sometimes nice to have somebody to have your back. In a bilateral agreement, we are going nowhere with the United States. Well, and, and so this whole thing about, you know, I want to bring these jobs back to Canada. Okay, Doug. You do realize that we here in North America, and Mexico included, are addicted to cheap goods. If you bring all those jobs back, as you say you want to, you're going to piss off your oligarch puppet masters because they're going to have to start paying living wages to their employees to build those things. Which, we all know, the reason they went to Mexico to begin with was so they could increase their margin by paying less for yes. everything and if we build them here in canada which yeah i think it's a great idea let's just say the goods that we like to purchase on a daily basis right now things like oh i don't know clothing electronics television sets things of that nature that would be assembled here in canada they will become unaffordable almost instantly do you remember when a television set in the 70s for a 26 inch color console was a thousand dollars now a thousand dollars today will get you a hell of a tv a thousand dollars in the 70s oh let's take a look because i remember when friends of ours family friends longtime friends purchased a new tv in 1975 and they paid a thousand dollars for it I'm like oh well that's that's crazy. Let's let's see what that cost here. I've got the old uh, the old uh, Bank of Canada ah uh, inflation calculator. Yes, let me just pull it up here, and I'll, I'll get you the numbers. I'll have to type it back in because I can't remember where the bookmark is. There we go. <laughs> it was listening. 
literally ah. I, went, I typed in b and it brought the inflation calculator up immediately okay let's say one thousand dollars in 1975 mm -hmm. today would cost holy shit <laughs> take a guess four thousand fifty four hundred well so you can almost guarantee that is what you would pay for a new television today. Now, that's what, it, when I was in Uruguay a number of years ago, my uh, buddy brought a new laptop down for his brother because to purchase a laptop in Uruguay will cost you a literal arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. Everything, electronics is so expensive there. Mm -hmm. Outrageously expensive now. Food, not expensive at all. Dining out, not expensive at all. Buying drinks, not expensive at all. Housing, relatively affordable. But everything else you need in your life, really expensive. Because mm -hmm. they don't have large manufacturing. I mean, they're, they're a country that's mostly uh, agricultural exports. But where I'm going with this is if Doug Ford wants to do that, okay, you know, great. It's going to bring in good paying jobs to Canada because they'll have to meet certain criteria and pay a basic livable wage. Also benefits and et cetera, et cetera. Safety concerns, which increase the costs, which would cut into the margin and they can't let their margin go, which means we're now going to pay $5,400 for what would be a, a television set. Right. Just, you know, mm -hmm. just something to think about. Indeed. Doug didn't think this through at all. Because it when would really about, tank the economy. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Now, when asked about the Ontario Premier's proposal, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said practically all of Canada's international partners have expressed concern with, quote, Chinese overcapacity and, quote, unfair trade practices that the Chinese community is, in, sorry, that the Chinese economy is inflicting on our world. We're going to continue to work with partners like the U.S. and hopefully Mexico as well to make sure that we are united in our desire to protect good jobs, said Trudeau while speaking in New Brunswick. There's lots of work to be doing, and that's a big topic of conversation that we're going to have with the new American administration in the coming months. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for the International Trade Minister, Mary Ng, said Canada is committed to working with the United States to ensure continued prosperity for Canadians and Americans alike. According to Robert Wolf, Professor M at Queen's University School of Paul Ford's comments are a signal to the federal government that Canada should side with the U.S. in any further future trade tensions with Mexico. Quote, what we know is the Trump administration is going to put intense pressure on Mexico to stop transshipment through Mexico from China, and Mexico might want to look at to its partners in the trilateral for support, said Wolf. What Ford is saying is we should not support them and we should support the Americans on this one. Wolf emphasized that it's a, quote, fair worry that Mexico has indeed become, as Ford alleges, a backdoor for Chinese goods, but as China has demonstrated a pattern of trying to circumvent existing trade barriers. Quote, there's been lots of talk about how China is going to use and already is using other countries as kind of way stations to North America and Europe, he told iPolitics. Quote, that's a particular worry with Mexico because they're inside the perimeter, as it were, thanks to the USMCA. But Mexico is an important trading partner for us and even more important trading partner for the U.S. So I think there will be intense efforts to make sure that Mexico is on board with China policy. So how likely is it that Canada will heed Ford's advice and pursue a bilateral deal? Not likely at all, said Wolf. Quote, this will all get sorted out, he said, and not because Ford made a statement. One of the things the 2026 review will look at is whether there are strong enough provisions on anti-circumvention. That's to make sure none of the USMCA countries become a backdoor for evading measures which is a common thing in regional trade agreements, I'm sure. And I would hope that Mexico finds a way to stay on board. So uh, mm. Ford coming out and making pronouncements on uh, what we should do with trade policy with regard to Mexico and his frequent uh, pronouncements on what the Bank of Canada should be doing on interest rates kind of for a federal run one day. He's not smart enough. And I hope people in Canada are smart enough to recognize he's not smart enough. Yep. I don't know that that's the case, though. They elected him twice and gave him a majority in the last election. And again, I say a lot of that has to do with the, the newspaper, the news media in this country, and this saying, oh, he's going to win, he's going to win, he's going to win in a landslide, he's changed, he's better, he's this, he's that. The polls say this, the polls say that. You know what you can do with your polls, eh? Mm, something like Madonna suggested the movie Truth or Dare. Yes, 
<laughs> Good on catching that one. I saw that in the theater. I, I had uh, free tickets for the debut of it here in the city at the old Phoenix, which is now a shopper's drug mart on Bank Street and uh, Bank and Gladstone. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, internationally, as we mentioned, the Prime Minister is traveling. Uh, he was in Bermuda for the funeral of a friend, longtime family friend yesterday, and now he's on his way to the APEC uh, conference, which is in Lima, Peru, and then will be followed by the G20 in uh, Rio. So that's where the Prime Minister is today. Uh, he's going to have two days of high-level closed-door economic cooperation, uh, economic leaders meeting, where according to his office, he intends to engage with other APEC leaders to deepen cooperation and advance opportunities for people on both sides of the Pacific. I believe there are 31 member states of that organization, so it's still pretty big, and I think it controls about 60% of the world GDP. So uh, it's an important uh, summit. Uh, Rural Development Minister Goody Hutchins will visit the St. John's Newfoundland campus of Memorial University to share the details of fresh federal support for the 2025 Canada Games, which will be held in and around the city next summer. That will be going on at 11.30 if you're in that area. Innovation Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne joins Ontario Premier Doug Ford, as well as his provincial counterpart Vic Fideli, at a, quote, groundbreaking ceremony at the site of the e-battery component manufacturing plant that Japan-based multinational Asahi Kasei intends to build in Port Colborne. So that happens this morning at 9.45. And Mental Health and Addictions Minister Yara Sachs drops by the downtown Toronto headquarters of Kids Help Phone, where, in addition to announcing fresh funding to boost, quote, youth mental wellness, she'll also host a panel discussion on providing mental health counseling and crisis supporting to young people. And that will be going on around uh, 10 a.m. today. And uh, last, you mentioned it earlier, are you ready for it? Do -do, do -do, do -do. <laughs> Baby, let Taylor begin. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Destination. What you were about. I don't know. What you're about. Sorry. I didn't know what you were talking about there for a minute. <laughs> yes, Destination Toronto, a nonprofit tourism agency, estimates that the city of Toronto will stand to gain about two hundred eighty-two million dollars from the economic activities surrounding Taylor. Swift six dates in the first of which is tonight, Kits and Cubs. City officials are boosting transit services and establishing a red zone of street closures downtown, right around the Rogers Center. Uh, as you know, Kits and Cubs, uh, Taylor Swift's three shows in Austria had to be cancelled uh, a little earlier uh, on the tour because of threats of violence. So mm -hmm. uh, these perimeters have somehow become necessary. And in related news, um, this came out yesterday, a teen has been charged with and wounding 10 other people in a stabbing rampage at a Taylor Swift themed dance class in England this summer. We had talked about it on the, the show. Um, and he is uh, set to go on trial early next week, according to a judge. He has not entered a plea. He continued to refuse to speak in court as he has at previous hearings, and he pulled a sweatshirt up over his face and wouldn't identify himself or acknowledge the judge. The trial is expected to last four to six weeks, and another hearing was scheduled for this. He was charged in August murdering three girls, Alice De Silva, Aguiar, Elsie Dot Stancom, and B.B. King, and stabbing 10 other people on July 29th in the seaside town of Southport in northern England. He was charged last month with additional counts of production of a biological toxin, ricin, and procession of information likely to be useful to a person committing or preparing to commit an act of terrorism for having the manual in a document or his computer. So all around, a uh, real uh, upstanding guy. Uh, pol police said the stabbings have not yet been classified as not yet known but they fueled far-right activists to stoke anger at immigrants and Muslims after social media falsely identified uh, another person uh, going by the name of, his name here, Axel Radu Kubana. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Okay. They falsely identified 
him, but he's the one being charged. I, I don't know, man. Okay. Uh, rioting spread across England and Northern Ireland that lasted a week. More than 1,200 people were arrested for the disorder and hundreds have been jailed. Yeah, there's got to be an error in this mistake. Oh, it sounds like it was written by a chatbot. Uh, uh, in this article. Okay. Probably written by a chatbot. Well, because I, I thought the story was that they had misidentified a Muslim person, but that the act had been committed by somebody that was uh, born there. Hmm. And white. Because, I mean, you can't be Muslim and born. I mean, this guy here, uh, Raju Cabana, was born in immigrants. But... Okay. Uh, so something yeah, must have been I wrong in one of the stories. Because if he's falsely identified, then why is the one being charged? Oh, well. I don't understand it. But, yeah, that's going ahead. So, uh, in related news. Um, so... There you go. Taylor Swift, for all of those who, who have got tickets, uh, please have fun. Please enjoy uh, the concert safely and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not, uh, police are not really worried in the sense that Taylor Swift fans are like loud and happy and enthusiastic, but they're not known to be particularly violent or vandalizing. So uh, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little story about Taylor Swift and concert tickets that I thought was interesting that a friend of mine told me last night. He said uh, a colleague of his had, uh, with three other friends, booked tickets when they first went on sale, and they managed to score four of them. One woman just got four, and she says, excellent. She goes, I've got one for you, one for you, one for you, one for you. And then she decided that when somebody offered her $4,000 a piece to sell two tickets, including one of her friends, so she banked $8,000 on selling her Taylor Swift, two of the four Taylor Swift tickets. So she's going and so is her best friend. And I guess the other friends are no longer speaking to her. And I can understand why, because she chose a few bucks over friendship. So not a good friend to begin with, if you ask me. Ooh. Like, yikes. Ooh. That's a decision. Yeah, that's, that's a decision, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I couple of quick hits here. before. Oh, oh go, go, go ahead, Mr. Grizzly. Sure. So you remember how uh, Telesat is under under with loans from the federal government is developing our own satellite based internet service. Correct. You recall that, which will be uh -huh. encrypted and safe, and this and that and the other thing. And then the conservatives immediately said, "Why won't Elon Musk do it? Elon says he can do it for less." Okay. Do they regret saying that now, considering how off the rails he's kind of gone, and um, now he's the uh, Doge, Dogecon, Department yes. of Government Efficiency for the United States of America? It's like, did, will conservatives apologize for their, their short-sightedness and the fact that they don't think about a damn thing before they speak and just say, we can save money if we hand it to the private sector? Well, tell us that is the private sector to begin with, number one. Number two, it will also have the interest of Canadians in mind, even though it's not a fully owned Canadian company. It's not owned by one guy who was a megalomaniac. Where, where's the apology? I'm, I'm expecting one. Oh, wait, I'll never get it. I'll never get it. I'll never hear sorry from the conservatives for anything they've done. Ever. I mean, remember when Stephen Harper apologized to the indigenous community in this country? Mm -hmm. And then reparations that were tort, that were founded to be paid to them by Supreme Court of Canada. And what did Pierre Polyev have to say about that? Need to get up and start working hard. So, you know, they can apologize and at the same time turn around and insult you right to your face. So mm -hmm. don't expect an apology from them about this. Mm -hmm. We know that the man is, is in bed with, with Putin and the Saudis. So don't expect an apology from the conservatives. It won't happen. Never. 
never. You never might get a cursory, we're sorry about that, but somebody will turn around and, and insult somebody else in the process. So, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, if you live in Saskatchewan, uh, even though you just went through a provincial election, you had another election because there were civil collections across the side, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan. Residents across the province headed to the polls Wednesday to cast ballots for mayors, reeves, councillors, and school board trustees. Um, let's see. And uh, in the city of Regina, I believe there is a new mayor. Uh, they had 11 candidates, and Chad Baczynski turns out to have been the winner. He got 16,500 and eight votes, defeating Lori Bresciani, who got 13,041, and Sandra Master, who got 12,114. Um, many wearing t-shirts sporting the slogan, Chad Bajinski, hard to spell, easy to choose. Shortly after 10 p.m., a phone call from the returning officer for elections Regina, Jim Nichol, invited him down to City Hall as mayor-elect and uh, Baczynski was glowing, uh, allegedly, for uh, he yelled, we did it in front of a jubilant cloud. And for a man who started his day totally normal, getting his kids off to school before heading to work, Baczynski was happy to ring in the night the way he did. Quote, this is a role I do not take lightly, and I want to express my deep appreciation to everyone who believed in our vision and our message, he said shortly after arriving at City Hall for a customary address to media. People obviously want some change. There's been a lot of talk happening about who's supporting who, and I can confidently say we ran a true grassroots word of mouth campaign through and through, and I think that really resonated with people. There were a total of 52,402 votes cast, according to the city's website, and all the other seven candidates, uh, other than the top four, each came in with less than 3% of the vote. All results are considered unofficial until confirmed Thursday at 1 p.m. by Nickel. Uh, Master's time as mayor ended much as it began with a round of applause from staff and supporters gathered around her on election night. Quote, it was an honor and a privilege to serve the citizens of Regina, said Masters from her campaign headquarters after the vote was called. Quote, truly the honor of a lifetime. I couldn't have asked for a better job the last four years. Now, there you go. Uh, and in the city of Saskatoon, um, there is also a new mayor. And that would be Cynthia Block, who's been elected as the new mayor. She's had to two terms as city councillor, and she becomes the first woman to lead City Hall over there. With 82 of 82 polls reporting, Block had received 30,412 votes. Former Saskatchewan Party MLA Gordon Wyant was in second with 20,259, and former Saskatoon Mayor Don Atchison sat in third with 10,460. Uh, I am honored, Block said, when asked how she feels about being the first woman elected mayor in Saskatoon. Quote, I think representation matters. I want every woman and girl to know that they can lead, but ultimately I think that what connected most with residents in this campaign had to do with the vision of our city. She also thanked, quote, the strong group of women that led many aspects of her campaign. She was first elected to Saskatoon City Council in 2016 and spent two terms representing Ward 6 before announcing her run for mayor. She's a former journalist that also ran for the Liberal Party in the 2015 federal election. Quote, this isn't my victory, she said. This is Saskatoon's victory. Saskatoon has chosen a city for all people. They want a modern 21st century city that's moving forward, not backward. A city with that is increasingly representative of, pe of places around the world. She said her campaign focused on the economy and housing and did not shy away from a record on city council, touting her support in securing $41 million from how Ottawa's housing accelerator fund. And she said she'll continue to support LINK, the bus rapid transit system. Block is very familiar with the downtown area arena project as she was city council's strategic lead for the downtown event and entertainment district development. And she has often cited her promise to create a task force focused on homelessness and community safety. And she also says the city needs more enhanced and basic shelter spaces and should establish 24-hour drop-in centers. I like this. On the economy, Block promised to create a new tax subclass for small business and streamline permitting and licensing aided by a new business connection hub to help business owners navigate City Hall. She also said she would push for new incentives targeting repairs of affordable rental units, lobby the province to change the Saskatchewan Income Support Program, and lobby the federal government to put more money into homelessness. I'm really liking her. Block defeated four other candidates running for Mayor Wyant Aitchison, Carrie Tarasoff, and Mike Harder. 
In 2020, outgoing Mayor Charlie Clark won his second term with 46.61% of the vote. In 2020, voter turnout hit 27.1%, a big drop from the 40% turnout in the 2016 election. Saskatoon elected six new city councillors and re-elected four incumbents. And let's see, what else do we have? And uh, as of April, the mayor's salary is $165,365, and each councillor makes $76,068. The new city council will take over stewardship of several significant projects that got underway during the previous term, the new downtown arena and entertainment district, construction of a new library, and development of Link, the bus rapid transit system. Community safety and affordable housing crunch and policing consumed a lot of the attention of the previous city council, and those issues aren't going away. The ongoing debates around the emergency wellness center in the Fairhaven neighborhood and the new downtown shelter will also be on the council's agenda. I think that's most of the stuff there. Oh, there were also school board elections, uh, and uh, that happened as well. Five candidates were claimed, and uh, the new public school trustees are Tanya Knapper, Vernon Linklater, Donna Banks, Kim Strandon, the latter three were acclaimed, Jennifer Sherman, Kirk Jones, Ross Tate, who was acclaimed, Anne-Marie Rollo, Kevin Schmidt, and Angela Arneson, who was also acclaimed. And then there were seven people elected in the separate school board race, and that uh, involves Diane Boyko, Owen Fortoski, J.R. Bochler, Sharon sakreski Warbicki, Tim Jelinski, Kate Day, and Michelle Christopher. And uh, if you live in Saskatchewan and you're wondering about the results in uh, smaller communities, please check online uh, to find out about uh, that. All right. Okay. Mr. Grizzly, if, unless you have anything else, I think we have a show. Uh, there's about five or six other things, but I'll, I'll use them tomorrow because they're all just little tidbits and I don't, I've, I've got a raging migraine right now and I have to take Lola out for a walk shortly. So I'll, uh, I'll bring them up tomorrow. All right then. Kits and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And you have the mouths from which we want the word to come. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. We love it when you do it. And if you wouldn't want to miss an episode, because why would you? Well, then you have to thank our friend, The Ray Girl, for sponsoring our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. Or if you scan the QR code that Mr. Grizzly is going to make appear right about now. It's already there. <laughs> there we go. Boom. You go there and that will bring you to our pod page. And if you find the subscribe button there, well, if you click it, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. No fuss, no searching. We deliver because we like to help. Now, if you'd like to help us in other ways, then you need to make like Kit Elaine and surf yourself on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page where we have some buttons for you. Like, share, and subscribe. They're just sitting there waiting, all gussied up and pretty, waiting for you to come along and just click on them. And that will get us some happy when you do that. Now, if you want to help us in other ways, then perhaps... You would like to encourage us to do more by supporting us financially and helping to underwrite the costs of producing and bringing the show to you. If you would like to do that, the QR code that has appeared by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to our tip jar, otherwise known as our coffee page, coffee, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And if you have a little bit of coinage and would like to drop it in our jar, you will earn our undying gratitude and your sex appeal will instantly increase by 37.2%. We've tested it in our labs. This is serious stuff. So please support us. Thank you very much. But if you can't support us financially, please don't worry. The gift of your attention and participation is the gift that matters the most to us. And we are so glad to hear from you. So write from write to us. True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is our email address at True Eager, both on Twitter, and now at Blue Sky, because the queen is there, waiting for all the loyal subjects to come and say hello. Because it's like at the beginning when you set up a new site and you see like all the numbers go up, and since people are migrating, the numbers are going up fast, so I feel like the popular kid in school all over again, which is kind of cool. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, True North Eager Beaver on Facebook, and of course, if you're listening here on YouTube, Right down below, uh, you can leave some comments. We do 
try to read everything. We can't necessarily answer everyone, uh, but we do because uh, your comments help us improve the show immensely. And we thank you for taking Does democracy something that you do? Remember, kids and cubs, if you are living in Nova Scotia, and boy, there are some of them tomorrow, but uh, um, some people doing some interesting things with Tim Horton gift cards. Yeah. It seems. That's just a on that one. We'll get to that tomorrow, but just a little tease there. But uh, if you are in Nova Scotia, you have an election coming up on the 26th, so please research your candidates. If you have one that you like, volunteer for them or volunteer at a polling station, and please tell your friends that you are very excited about voting because kids do not allow kids to do democracy alone. Bring people with you to the polling station. Same thing goes for you if you live in British Columbia in the writing of Cloverdale Langley. You have a by-election coming up in mid-December. So uh, make sure that uh, you do what you need to do to cast an informed vote there. Kids, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, please tell us that you have some various today. I really don't, honestly. Um, oh, poop. I got a... I know I got a pounding headache right now and I'm under like a dozen lights and it's really beginning to take its toll on me. So I got to, I got to tap out and uh, I do have an Easter egg for everybody though. It's uh, three minutes and 22 seconds of beauty. You will love it. Trust me, but we'll uh, have a look at that just on the other side of this. Okay. Cue the cock. You are listening to a true North eager beaver media incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I think you're all going to enjoy this very much, what I'm about to show you. This is from a week ago, uh, post-election post-U.S. election, that is. This is a, a woman on TikTok who wrote a song, and wait till you hear this. I've been up since 4 a.m. This song is brought to you by Female Rage. Well, you could say that my whole life's been hell Cause I was born with the curse of a labeled female no, it don't matter who you know or if you're rich If you're a girl, then they'll still call you a bitch The men are saying, oh, hun, we don't understand But you just missed, I flinched when you raised your hand It's sad to say, but our stories all have been told And at this point, oh, babe, it's just getting old if you play stupid games, then you win stupid prizes. And you asked, so I will share. Well, I guess you thought you would get another answer. But if all in love and war is truly fair, then I'll take the bear. I'll take the bear. Just look around, most of you will agree The rest of you think that I am crazy Well, that's okay, I won't tell you that you're wrong If you need proof, just ask a girl why she's strong If you play stupid games, then you win stupid prizes And you ask, so I will share well, I guess you thought you would get another answer But if all in love and war is truly fair Then I'll take the bear I'll take the bear 
The bear wouldn't follow me home. The bear would just leave me alone. The bear wouldn't poison my drink. The bear's got more brains than you think. The bear knows the meaning of halt. The bear wouldn't say it's my fault. If you play stupid games, then you win stupid prizes. And you ask, so I will share. Well, I guess you thought you would get a better answer. But if all in love and war is truly fair, and we know that you're not dumb and unaware, but the fact is that you just don't fucking care. So we'll take the bear. So you know what she's singing about there, right? The uh, question a few months back about uh, who would you choose if you met in the woods, a man or a bear? And the resounding amount of women over, you know, overwhelmingly said the bear. And that's what that song is about. And it's also about, you know, uh, idiot males who suddenly went out holding up signs that said, uh, your body, my choice forever. So, yeah. Right. Dark days indeed. See ya.